Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday, where I run through the current version of my Sunday sermon. We're numbed by familiarity. After 2,000 years, for many people, if you say Jesus is God, they don't blink. They don't think about it. It's just become a matter of definition. And a lot of the strangeness is lost um, of the audacity of, of this statement. This is what C.S. Lewis says in Mere Christianity. Then comes the real shock. Among these Jews, there suddenly turns up a man who goes about talking as if he was God. He claims to forgive sins. He says he has always existed. He says he is coming to judge the world at the end of time. Now let us get this clear. Among pantheists, like Indians, anyone might say that he's part of God or one with God. There would be nothing very odd about it. But this man, since he was a Jew, could not be in that kind of God. God, in their language, meant the being outside the world, who had made it and was infinitely different from anything else. And when you have grasped that, you will see what this man said was, quite simply, the most shocking thing that has ever been uttered by human lips. Now, it might sound strange to you, but the Trinity continues to be a hot topic, especially on the internet. About four years ago, I received a, a rando's request from a young man who lives in the Chicago area, and he, uh, he identified himself as a biblical Unitarian. He had grown up in a church that doesn't believe in the Trinity. And right away, I was sort of nervous to talk to him because I didn't quite know what to think or to do. I was used to Muslims and Jews and Jehovah's Witnesses who are Unitarians, but this guy was, in many respects, he had been worshiping among evangelical churches and had had a rough time of it every now and then when, when someone found out uh, what he did and didn't believe. And, you know, over the last four years, we've become friends. He's a very smart guy. He really knows his stuff when it comes to uh, ancient church fathers and creeds and the like. But this is a, this is a big topic. Uh, Jesus is God. And uh, he and a lot of the Jewish friends that I have say, no. Now, the Trinity is a very difficult doctrine to articulate, um, or the divinity of Christ. Uh, most who go beyond the words of the creed sort of fall into one heresy or another. We're about to have a, um, a meeting of classes, and there'll be a classical examination, and the people examined for uh, ministry will be asked to give an articulation of the Trinity. And uh, everyone just sort of always sits back and You'll hear some words about mystery, and you'll hear some creedal language. But again, usually if people sort of, um, when you go to seminary, they start warning you about analogies because many of the analogies sort of put you in hot water. Now, we're leaving Paul's letter to the Philippians, and we're starting Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. Now, Ephesus was a big city. Uh, Philippi is a felt, well, fairly well-known place. Colossae was part of three cities that were inland, and it was probably the least important of the three cities. In fact, even though people today know where it's located, nobody's bothered to excavate it. But one of these letters, but Paul writes a letter to that church. Now, unlike many of the other places that he wrote letters to, uh, he had never visited that city. In fact, um, Epaphras, who is named in the book, likely became a Christian when Paul was working in Ephesus. If you go, if you go back, you can see that if you follow this river valley, it goes all the way to Colossae, and Ephesus is where it goes out to the sea. And it's usually these cities that are on the coast that are the most important, and these inland cities are smaller. Now, again, we're, we're sort of left on, we know Paul is in prison when he writes the letter. We don't know if he's in prison in Ephesus, because Ephesus is obviously fairly close, or if, this, or if he's in prison at Rome. We don't know that. We also don't know a lot about the city or its situation. We know that there were some Jewish settlements earlier in the century there, um, but we really don't know sort of the makeup of the church. And so what scholars do is they read the letter carefully and they try to infer from the letter. And we're also a little unclear about exactly what the reason was that Paul wrote the letter. Was there a problem in the church that Paul wanted to address? Um, we'll get into that as we go through the book. The letter begins as many of Paul's letters usually begin. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people at Colossae. 
the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among, among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You heard it from Epaphras. This is how we found out how the church was planted. Our dear fellow servant, who is your faithful minister of our Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. So Epaphras has probably been going back and forth. Epaphras has been the one who planted the church, been keeping the church going, and has sort of been going back and forth between Paul and the church. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live lives worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Now this talk about inheritance and the holy people, leads a lot to believe that the audience may very well have been predominantly Gentile because that's language of participation in the inheritance and the blessings of the God of Israel. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Also, talk about the dominion of the darkness tend to lead us to believe this is probably a Gentile audience. Now, I'm sort of working this up, and I gave you the introduction I did, because we're going to get into questions of Christology. What we have in this letter to the Colossians is one of the most dramatic, um, one of the most dramatic articulations of the divinity of Christ that we find in the New Testament. In fact, it's so dramatic that it's led some scholars to have questions about the dating of the letter because it's so well developed and it's so well put together that many believe it was, in fact, a hymn that was sung, not unlike the hymn in Philippians 2 that we found before. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Now again, as Lewis notes, this is a very strange thing to say about a human being. It's in fact deeply shocking. And even for Gentiles who didn't have quite the strict limits on... A, quite the strict imagination about who the Hebrew God was, this is still startling language. You have divinizings of Caesar and great men in history, but nothing would be nothing like this would be said of them. Uh, the sun is the image of the invisible God. Now the Greek word for image there is icon, where we get our language of icon. And icon is, is generally supposed to be something that's looked through instead of looked at. And the idea is that we see God through Jesus. Jesus is the icon of the God we cannot see. All creation was made for him, which again, if you think about that, it's a very shocking thought and made through him, which you think about Jesus of Nazareth, another very shocking thought. Seems to be saying that, well, Jesus did just not come from conception or birth. Jesus was there at creation. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to where this hymn comes from. Some speculate that it might have been an early Jewish hymn that sung praise to the Logos. You hear about the Logos in John 1. Or praise to Wisdom. You can look at Lady Wisdom in the book of Proverbs that was adapted and put Jesus in there as Logos and Wisdom instead. That's speculative. We don't have a poem where all the other pieces are put together and many of the other pieces that will come in this little song 
are obviously deeply connected to Jesus. But it's very hard to get our mind around this. And as, as C.S. Lewis said, if, if a man shows up and he basically says, all, um, it says this about himself, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Well, that's a dramatic statement. Um, visible and invisible, he reigns over all things, things we see and things we don't, and the, sp and the spirits that rule the world, and all was created for him and through him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Again, as what we said with the creeds, it's hard to sort of put this in your own words without somehow making it less than or having it go off the track. But there are the words. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. It's clearly a reference to the resurrection. So that in everything he might have supremacy. So he, in fact, conquers death. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus is fully man and fully God. Uh, by Jesus, the rebellion of the world is resolved from top to bottom. All of this is accomplished through his blood shed on the cross. Um, it's left as a statement, um, but atonement, basically people try to get their minds wrapped around that. He defeats the rebels. He de defeats the rebel spirits, these principalities and powers that rebelled against him. He also um, is a sacrifice to free people from the rebellion. All of these things are sort of built into these statements by making peace through his blood shed on the cross reconciling to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Now, this is a difficult thing to picture, and I would, I would advise you to maybe take your Bible in a quiet moment and open up this passage and just read through the verse slowly a few times to just try to let it sink in and try to sort of get your mind around it. And all analogy of trying to put something like this together really does fall short. We, we very much feel ourselves to sort of be actors in an arena. But we also know that sometimes certain human beings, great leaders in the world, sort of change the arena. And as we grow up within a culture or within a society, we sort of pick up all of the assumptions of that society and we live out of those assumptions. We also know that authors write books, and authors, when they write books, create these worlds. And we often imagine that these authors are simply sort of mechanically putting things in this world, and they all sort of come out of their head in a straightforward way. If you listen to most authors, that's by no means the sort of process that it happens. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, one of the 20th century's greatest fiction authors, talked about us as being sub-creators, that in fact, um, creation sort of flows through us from God. Um, now, Dorothy Sayers, another mid-century English writer, she was the first woman to graduate from Oxford, and she wrote mystery novels. And there was a protagonist, a man, in all, almost all of her mystery novels, and he was, the, he was the main character. And along comes a woman in one of these novels, and she's the first woman to have ever graduated from Oxford, and she's a mystery writer, and she falls in love with and marries the protagonist in these stories. And a bunch of people said, hey, wait a minute, who is that character that you put in the story? You love this character in your story so much, you decided to write yourself into the story and live with your character. Well, this is quite an accomplishment of creation. Now, when C.S. Lewis wrote the Narnia Chronicles, these were some of the last books he wrote. And it really took people by surprise because here is a, here is a single man who didn't seem to know many children, didn't seem to have too much interest in children, and he decides to write children's books after he had had a long and distinguished career in English literature, uh, writing important books and important papers and all of this stuff. He starts writing children's books. 
and he describes a little bit about what people thought, thought the process was. Some people seem to think that I began by asking myself how I could say something about Christianity to children, then fixed on the fairy tale as an instrument, then collected information about child psychology and decided what age group I'd write for, then drew up a list of basic Christian truths and hammered out al um, allegories to embody them. This is all pure moonshine. I couldn't write in that way at all. Everything began with images, a fawn carrying an umbrella, a queen on a sledge, a magnificent lion. At first there wasn't even anything Christian about them. That element pushed itself in of its own accord. Now it's interesting if you read back over Lewis's, over Lewis's biography, you see that he started to try to write the book and nothing just came and then he describes how it all came together. In a paper entitled, It All Began With a Picture, Lewis said, Suddenly Aslan came bounding into it. I don't know where the lion came from or why he came, but once he was there, he pulled the whole story together. I think this is a good way of describing at least part of what this passage in Corinthians is saying in a way that we can sort of understand that Jesus was before all things, all things were made for him, all things were made through him, in him all things hold together, in his sacrifice he's bringing everything together and bringing the story to its glorious conclusion. Sort of the way that Lewis sat there with all of the pieces and then Aslan comes from some place he doesn't know and suddenly the story starts to take shape and seven books of course will follow. And you know, even human authors, there's a dynamic between the author and the creation. You'll find authors talking about their fictional works like this all the time. It's certainly they have a degree of mastery over it, but often the authors will say, well, these are the characters. And if the authors don't respect the characters as sort of sub-creations in and of themselves, well, the book just doesn't work. The good author respects the creation while still governing it and finds ways to bring the creation to its conclusion in ways that don't break or destroy the creation itself. Now the story of our world is the work of the Trinity. God wrote himself into the story. Jesus comes into the story and pulls the story together and, and, and through it, it's Sometimes I write sentences that don't make sense. Jesus comes into the story and pulls the story together. Through him, the tensions are resolved, and the story comes to its glorious conclusion. It's strange to think of a man among us in this way, but that's perhaps the best analogy that I can think of to communicate these startling claims of this passage. Now, in some ways, we're under a spell. We have, very, we have a great deal of difficulty thinking outside the cultural concepts that we grew up and we were given. We think there is no story, no meaning, no purpose, no plan. It's just chaos and physics, and human beings are the only conscious agents, um, if in fact we are that. What if Jesus came bounding into your story and set your story straight? The people in the Gospels were clueless about what he did, and it all seemed so wrong. Shouldn't lions eat Romans instead of Christians? He was both lion and lamb and set the story right in a way no one could imagine before him. But we slowly begin to see it as he moves the story forward. This is what Lewis said of him. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. This is the only thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or he would be a devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You cannot shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him. You can kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that that uh, he has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. This is how Paul finishes this section. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. 
But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel you heard, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Amen.